So the things that, that I'll tell you are things as I best remember them. Um, if I quote right, it may not be an exact quotation because over a long period of time things get distorted. But I'll give you my best memories. Um, I'll tell you first how I came to Ergonomy and how I got to rest. A man who was a scholar in this city when I was in medical school um, said to me, he knew I was interested in psychiatry, and he said to me, I have read a book that I think you'd be interested in. And I said, what is it? And he said, Sexual Revolution by Wilhelm Reich. And I said, oh, that guy, he's a nut. And he said, how do you know he's a nut? I said, everybody knows he's nuts. <laughs> and he said, don't you think you might read a book before you call a man a nut? So that was reasonable. So I read Sexual Revolution. And to people who read Sexual Revolution in this day, it is not as much a magnificent opening of the mind as it was when I read it, which was probably in the very early 40s. And at that time, I was considering going into psychoanalysis. And I had been shopping around for an analyst in the city. And I had taken courses and had gone to lectures. And of the people who were psychoanalysts whom I knew, I hadn't yet found one that I would entrust myself to. Uh, and when I read Sexual Revolution, there were the answers to so many questions that I had raised in my coursework and hadn't gotten reasonable, straightforward answers to. So sexual revolution was a mind opener to me. And thereafter, I read all of Wright's books that were available. And by the time I had finished reading them, I thought, this is the man to whom I want to go for therapy. So I called Reich, and he was in Forest Hills at that time. And we arranged an appointment. And I must tell you, of all the things that I read, the only thing that didn't sit too well with me was the concept of orgone energy. Because having been trained in classical science, orgone energy was a wild concept. So I had planned to go see right and to keep any mention of orgone energy out of the conversation. Because the therapy I knew made sense and I wanted to get into therapy with him. So I came to his office at Forest Hills on the appointed day and my first sight of Wright, he came down from the second floor stairway and the, the feeling that one got was this man is powerful just from the way he walked down the stairs. You had a feeling he was a powerhouse. So he first asked me, um, how did you get to me? What have you read? And I told him I had read all that was available at that time. And his second question was, what do you think of orgone energy? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, it seems very strange to me. And he said, of course it does. He said, because you've been trained in a way that's entirely different from uh, the way I think and 
the way that orgon energy research is directed. And if you ever get that far, you'll work in the laboratory, you'll do the experiments, and you'll find out for yourself whether orgon energy exists or not. And I thought that was a very reasonable response because somehow I'd expected him to say, you don't believe in orgon energy, then get the hell out of here. But he was very reasonable about it. So we started therapy, and one of the provisions of this therapy was um, you can quit anytime you want, or I can kick you out anytime I want, which I thought was reasonable also. So we started therapy, and it was immediately apparent to me what a powerful technique this was. You know, no one who has not been in therapy can really fully appreciate the power of the therapy. You must have experienced it in order to really know what it does. And I can remember uh, most sessions as far as pills, each time that I left a therapeutic session and was walking toward the subway, I felt like I had never remembered feeling. I was flying. And um, much more important to me than I assumed that it would, because um, so far as I knew, I was not in bad shape emotionally. And the reason I was pursuing therapy was mostly for training purposes, because I, I believe that anyone who goes into psychiatry should have been in therapy. So I had a kind of academic approach to therapy, but being in orgotherapy, uh, one's mind is quickly changed, like these things happen that you never anticipated happening to you. So in general, it was a very electrifying experience. Halfway through my therapy, um, Reich moved to Oregon in Maine. And he said, I'm going to move to Maine. Um, you want to go to another therapist down around here. And I said, oh no, I'm going to make. So, uh, about halfway through my therapy, I went every other week, um, I would drive up on Friday night. At, those, at that time, the, the roads were nothing like the, the superhighways that there are now going up the main. They were terrible roads. And I would drive all through the night on Friday and get to um, Oregon or the area at about oh, 06 o'clock in the morning, sleep for about two hours, and then go for a session on Saturday morning, and then go for another session on Sunday morning, and then drive home. And in the middle of winter time, when uh, people from down here couldn't drive on the road, people from Maine could drive in that kind of snow, but we couldn't. So then I used to fly to Augusta and hitchhike up to Oregon because there were always lumber trucks going along. So you could always hitch a ride up to Oregon. And I always considered it an adventure. I never um, looked forward uh, with any kind of apprehension about the fact, oh, now I have to go up to Maine. I always looked forward to the weekend that I went up to Maine, no matter what the weather. And when one has a patient who lives 30 miles away, he says, the weather's too bad. You know, I can't come today. I, I feel like you don't deserve therapy. 
Um, there's one interesting anecdote about driving to Maine. One day, Wright said to me, how long does it take you to drive from Philadelphia here? And I said, oh, a little more than 12 hours. And he said, well, it takes 12 hours from New York. So I said, yeah, but I drive pretty fast. So he said, you have a right to risk your own life, but you don't have a right to risk other people's lives. So unless it takes you 12 hours plus the time it takes to go from Philadelphia to New York, don't bother coming anymore. <laughs> so after that, I drove more slowly. So it took me 14 hours to get to Maine instead of 12 hours. Um, therapy with rights, I say, was exhilarating. Uh, there were times that it was, of course, frightening. And there's only one time that I have ever entertained the idea of suicide. I knew I wouldn't do it. But for one brief period, the idea of suicide entered my head, which was after a session with Wright. Um, and um, like that was a new experience for me having that kind of depressed feeling because generally I'm an up person I don't get depressed too easily um, in therapy the thing that was unique about Wright was how he always hit the nail on the head. Um, he just had amazing sensitivity and amazing acumen. He knew exactly where the patient was and he knew exactly what to do in order to evoke what had to be evoked at that time. And when he did, he often said, you will never be this good. And at times he said, I am the only organist. No one else can really do therapy. And compared to Wright, it was true. Um, We had one session um, that's interesting to talk about. Um, I had come for a series of sessions voicing some cynicism. Um, I accused him of exaggerating. Um, a little disbelief and at that time there were lots of, of uh, stories rampant the right was psychotic which I reported to him you know things that I had heard not as if I believed them but I was just reporting them to him so I came up for a session and he had a rifle standing by the fireplace in the room where he treated me. And he picked up the rifle and he pointed it at my head. And he said, I'm psychotic. <laughs> and I burst out laughing because like he, what he wanted to see was, did I really think that, did I believe these stories or was I like merely reporting them? So I burst out laughing because it just struck me so funny, the idea of a therapist putting a gun to a patient's head. <laughs> and that was all he needed. Like he laughed too, and he put the gun back. Uh, but that's how Wright 
got at somebody. He didn't monkey around. Like, if he wanted to see whether you believed he was crazy, he gave you ample chance to prove that you thought he was crazy. Uh, another interesting thing was, you know, there was a lot of talk did Wright become psychotic toward the end of his life. <clears throat> And uh, during one of my sessions, um, an airplane flew overhead. And he said, um, Eisenhower is sending those airplanes over to watch over me. And I said, I don't think so. I said, I think this place is just in the flight pattern of an airliner that is flying over this place. And he said, maybe. I said, we'll see. Uh, now that is not the, the reaction of a psychotic. You know, it's psychotic if he says, Eisenhower is sending that plane to watch over me, and I say, no, sir, I think that's an airliner just on a certain or his flight pad. He doesn't say, maybe you're right. He sticks to his guns. And the whole business of right psychosis, and I do believe that many of the ideas that he expressed uh, toward the end of his life were um, exaggerated, outlandish, uh, not realistic. Um, but I don't attribute that to psychosis. I attribute that to the kind of thinking that Rice did all his life. I think that Rice was truly one of the rare geniuses in this world. And I think that those people think by exploring all kinds of ideas that never occurred to us, that they push ideas way beyond the limits in that we hold ourselves to think in. And that because of that, he came up with so many of his marvelous ideas but that along with the marvelous ideas, there were also these cockeyed ideas, which those of us who always use common sense and are always careful to be correct would never arrive at. But he arrived at them in both a positive and a negative direction. And I think the idea of Eisenhower protecting him was an exaggerated idea in the negative direction. But it was his kind of thinking. Um, at seminars, um, he was very hard on the positions. And he sometimes would get so angry, and it was an anger such as I have never beheld. Once I remember we were outside, and he got so angry with us, and a storm came up. And I can believe that there was a connection between the intensity of his anger and that storm, because I've never seen such anger, and that storm came up so fast, I think he may have influenced the atmosphere. Um, and he also could be very gentle, very sympathetic, um, and particularly, um, now I remember uh, once at the end of a 
seminar on organ ones that went on for probably about a week. We had a party and dance at the end. And I thought, this is going to be interesting. I've never seen Rice in this role. And I remember one lady saying, I'm so scared to go to this thing. She'd never met Rice. And he was, like he was the essence of European gentlemanliness. Like he did everything but kiss the women's hands. He was just gentle and considerate and just a perfect gentleman in that kind of situation. And, you know, when I saw him in that situation and thought of some of the storms that I've seen him in, you know, I thought, well, that's like saying to those women, you should see him sometimes. He doesn't always act like this. Um, The essence of therapy with Wright was truthfulness. Um, one would never think of talking small talk with Wright. Um, there was always an atmosphere of deep seriousness. Um, I remember, um, I'm a tennis player, and Wright apparently played tennis too. And I had a feeling I'd love to play him because I think I could beat him. And I'd love to be, beat him. <laughs> uh, but uh, he never invited me to play tennis with so I never got the opportunity. Wait, let's, let's cut for a while. Let me think some more. Oh, I can remember another incident. So when you're in therapy, As the negative transfer starts operating, you do all kinds of silly things. Um, so I remember once before my session, I was standing downstairs where Reich's dining room was. Uh, and I heard him say to Peter, the son, um, shut up. So that was Chris for my mill. So when we had my session, uh, I said, I heard you talking to Peter, and I heard you say irritably to him, shut up. And I don't think that's how one should, should talk to children. <laughs> so he gave me a lecture <laughs> on how one talks to children. And the fact that shut up is the most direct way of accomplishing what he wanted to accomplish with Peter at that time. So, and I kind of half knew it as I was doing it. But you do things to try to irritate him. Because he's gotten you, you try to get back at him. Um, another time, I heard the sweetest discourse between him and Peter. And Peter wanted to know why do you spell nice with a K? He said, it should be called knife if you spell it with a K. And I don't remember the details, but Wright gave him the sweetest discourse on why there's a K in front of the N is nice. So, uh, 
there was a kind of thing that was almost learned, uh, but it was also the kind of thing that a child could easily understand. I remember a, um, difficulty that I had at one of my sessions in Oregon. I had been, before my session, uh, speaking with Dr. Silver. And, um, We've been speaking about electroshock therapy. And Silver said to me, uh, would you ever give a schizophrenic patient electroshock therapy? And I said, yes, because I've seen schizophrenics who did, like who couldn't be reached any other way. And in those days, there weren't the neuroleptics that we have today. So there was much, much less that you could do for schizophrenics in those days than you can now. And the electroshock was used pretty widely and sometimes with very good results. So I said, yes, I would use electroshock on, on the schizophrenic patients. And he said, you're no organist, Silver said. Uh, he said, the only people I'm interested in are the people who can be approached with organomy. And I thought, my God, this man is, is nuts. Um, you know, he, he is a, like he's a Nazi. He's an organomic Nazi. Um, and that disturbed me terribly. And so when I went in for my session, I repeated that conversation to Wright. And I repeated to him how amazed I was at, at Silbert's attitude. And Wright said, Silbert, like, you know, that poor guy, you have to forgive him. Uh, Because if Wright had had that same attitude, that would have caused a very, very serious rupture between him and me. Yeah. Uh, but he didn't at all. Um, oh, there was a, another incident. Um, I had been receiving some training in conventional psychiatry here with a Dr. Freed, who is a, he was actually a, psych, a psychoanalyst, but he did effective psychiatry. And um, Freed said that he was interested, he'd be interested in analyzing my dreams as I went through therapy. So that didn't seem like a very unreasonable idea to me. So I came to Wright and I said, uh, there's a Dr. Freed who's well respected, he's a good psychiatrist, and he's been helpful, helpful to me in my training, and uh, he wants to analyze my dreams as I go through therapy. <laughs> so Wright said, absolutely no. He says, he wants to steal my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so I went back to Dr. Freed and told them we couldn't do it. Uh, I certainly do not consider myself a genital character. Uh, my therapy ended um, I had gotten down to the pelvic segment and there was 
the considerable amount of energy that was getting into my pelvic segment. And I was never uh, interested in, um, in becoming a genital character. I was interested in being able to function uh, as in a manner that seemed to me efficient and to uh, have a wide range of emotional expression and to be able to thoroughly enjoy life. And by the time my therapy ended, all of those things had occurred. And at that point, I didn't feel that I wanted any more therapy. And I said to Wright, um, I would like to stop therapy now. What do you think about that? And he said, fine. And I said, if I ever feel the need for it, you know, may I contact you? And he said, of course. And that was the way that we ended because I just was functioning on a level that satisfied me at that point, and I didn't see any reason for going any further to therapy. Uh, we had uh, meetings at which we talked about things, but no more actual therapy. Um, but there was one thing that I thought of, Oh, um, this tells something about right. Uh, when I went up to, I sat through this whole trial up in Maine. And um, at one of the sessions, and it was a time of very great stress, like every day of that trial was a great stress. And at one point, um, we were standing around talking to him and he pointed to me and he said, come over here, I want to see you. So I came over and he said, I had written an article in one of the ergonomic journals. And he said, the way you wrote such and such is not as well as you might have written it. And I thought, Jesus Christ, here's this man in peril of his life, and he's worrying <laughs> how I put something in an article. And I thought, you know, that, that is really an indication of the man. That, that at that moment, that was as, as important to him as how his trial was going. <laughs> he was in peril, but he's worrying about how I'm writing an article. Um, during the trial, um, well, at the time, I was one of those who was in disagreement with the way he was conducting the trial. I thought he should have had a lawyer conducting his case instead of him conducting his own case. I think he should have used the legal arguments instead of the arguments that he used. Um, which is not to say that he was wrong because he viewed himself as a historical figure. And he was making a an historical point. And to make that, he had to conduct the trial that way. Uh, if I had been in his shoes, I would have wanted to escape jail. I would have wanted to be free, etc. So I would have conducted the, tr the trial on a strictly legal basis because the lawyers had said if you like we can win this case for you. Their their case is so weak that if you let us do our thing, 
we'll get you off. And he wouldn't do it. That's not what he, what he was after. Um, and since that time, you know, I've been told by people who teach law that that case is occasionally brought, brought up in the classroom as a, a case in which the FDA side was so weak and the case was pursued so poorly from the, from the legal standpoint that it's almost like a classical, a badly handled case from a legal point of view. Um, I never saw him um, after he went to jail. There were very few visitors, and the only people who visited him were those in his immediate family. So I had no contact with him after he went to jail. Um, start treating them, and then you'll discuss with me from time to time what you're doing with them and how it's going. And that's what I did. And there was some training. There were seminars, there was lab courses, so, so there was training. But there was a point at which he gave me the go-ahead to take on a couple of patients. And from that point, like, things were going all right, and he indicated, okay, take on some more. Yeah, I saw him in, um, as far as Hills, um, he would have clinical demonstrations. Uh, therapists would bring in patients that they were having difficulty with, and Wright would examine them in front of all of us, and uh, he would try to get to the red thread of what the, patient, what the physician had missed. And then he give the physician advice on how to pursue the case after that. So I saw him do that you know, a significant number of times. And they were wonderful learning experiences. And then up in Oregon, it, it happened also. The patients would bring difficult patients and he would discuss them in front of all of us. But uh, none of that made as deep an impression as what he did in, in one's personal therapy. Because then you really had a, an opportunity to see the skill of that man and the perception of that man. And it had a much deeper effect than seeing some other, than dealing with some other patients. Um, you know, I think Wright had a very clear idea that, with the exception of Rockness, that no one who is not a physician should do therapy. Like he stated that many times. So I think there was no doubt in his mind that with some exceptions, or rare exceptions, that therapy should be done by physicians. Um, and, you know, I have a feeling that he, um, I don't know how many, but I'm sure that there were some physicians who, in the course of their therapy or training, he dismissed. Like he said, you know, you're not for this work. And at that time, he could have used all the therapists that, that he could get because it was such a relatively small group that you know he needed he needed an army to propagandize organomy, but. Uh, he would rather do with fewer rather than more who might bring discredit to our economy. And even among those who he allowed to pass, I have reservations about some of that. Uh, 
erreichen kann, also äh, wie man Therapie eigentlich einsetzen kann. I think that um there is a market here. Um still in the psychiatric community there is very little knowledge of organ therapy. Um I'm sure that if you ask 90 out of 100 psychiatrists, or 95 out of 100 psychiatrists, what organ therapy is about, they can't tell you. Um, but there's a market in the lay community, um, and it's mostly by word of mouth. Uh, all of my patients are patient referred. So that um, one has a kind of experience in therapy and then one goes to one's crowd and says, are they see changes or and say, you know, what, what's happening to you? So that when you have a nucleus of patients, I think it spreads almost geometrically. Um, which is in this time, very different from psychoanalysis because in the United States, psychoanalysis has fallen on hard times. And there are relatively few psychoanalysts who have a full-time psychiatric practice. Uh, most of them are doing part-time hospital work and then part-time private work for their patients. But I hear that it's very difficult to get a full-time practice in psychoanalysis. It's absolutely true that you can never change one's essential character structure. If you're an obsessive compulsive, you're going to remain obsessive compulsive. If you're a hysteric, you're going to remain a hysteric. What therapy will achieve is If you were an obsessive compulsive operating within these limits, if your therapy is successful, you'll be an obsessive compulsive operating within these limits. So that you'll uh, be able to be far freer than you were when you came into therapy. You'll um, be able to achieve more happiness, your relationships will be better. All of that can be achieved in therapy. But when there is some acute stress or trauma in your environment, you'll respond the way an obsessive compulsive responds. That will be your, your essential response to anxiety. Uh, but the width will be much, much wider. And there are some patients um, who one doesn't take on in therapy. Um, if you sense that a patient has a very, very fragile structure, uh, you may get this sense you don't want to monkey with it. You don't want to push this person because it's tenuous and he's getting along all right. You know, not great, but he's getting along and you don't want to put pressure on this kind of an in individual. So some patients you send to talking therapy because that doesn't put as much pressure on them. And they can say, you know, ventilate and get some feelings released, et cetera, et cetera. Or, uh, sometimes I take on a patient and don't do anything but talk with them for six months until I have a feeling that there's enough solidity there that I can now put them on the couch. Problem, 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 problem,
man fühlt, äh, was man sich dabei denkt, wenn man das immer und immer wieder erlebt. What, what you learn to do is to balance out your day. For example, I would never put three depressed patients in a row. I would put one in the beginning of the day, one in the middle, and one at the end. Because you can't stand three depressed patients in a row. Um, in general, the intensity of the patient's pain uh, doesn't affect me um, when I recognize that there's a therapeutic benefit to this. Mm -hmm. That it may hurt this much right now, but ultimately this will cause less pain. Yeah. So it doesn't hurt me that much if the patient is hurting that much at this moment. Yeah. And contrary-wise, um, so many things happen in therapy which are marvelous releases of energy so that sometimes I can work 11 hours a day and if the last couple of patients have really produced, I go upstairs feeling wonderful. So patients put energy into you as well as take energy from you. Was glaubt ihr, was Therapie äh, tun kann heute, um die Situation zu verändern? Ja. Nicht der einzelnen Leute, sondern der allgemeinen Situation. Also inwieweit kann Therapie oder Therapeuten dabei helfen, um der gesellschaftlichen Umstieg zu werden? Das ist eine gute Frage. One of the most gratifying things that ever happened to me was in the, like long, long ago, uh, a group of people came to therapy, all of whom knew one another. It was almost like a, a club of people who knew one another, and they kept referring one another to therapy. So it was uh, like a little social group, and they were all in therapy with me. Uh, many years later, one of the members of that group came back because he had a problem that he wanted to discuss with me. And I said, um, do you see so-and-so? Do you see so-and-so? And he had been in contact with most of them. And he said, I'll tell you, Dr. Iskowitz, uh, you know, I know that therapy helped for all of them. He said, some of them I didn't like then. I still don't like them now. But I'll tell you one thing, their children look different than any other children I see. And I thought, wonderful. That is, he couldn't have said anything better. Because I think that <laughs> therapy can, can have no greater claim to glory than the fact that people raise their kids better after they've been in therapy. <coughs> so I, like that was the most wonderful thing he could have said. So that's how I think therapy, or one of the ways that therapy, you know, can help society. And as Reich said, I think that it will not occur in a brief period of time, but I think that when parents raise their children in a respectful, kind, generous way, that those kids will raise their kids in that way and maybe even more. And over many, many generations, we should get some good people living in this world. And the fact that it has that kind of effect on the generations, I think is wonderful. Because um, you know when you when you take a world view, uh, the number 
number of people who are very seriously emotionally disturbed and the number of patients that we treat it's not even a drop in the bucket so that from the standpoint of a global view you're doing practically nothing but if it has that kind of effect through generations the people will raise their children in a better way, that has a larger effect. Mm -hmm. Ich hätte gerne noch eine folgende Idee absurd finde. So. Äh, der Reich hat sich sehr viel Sorgen gemacht um die Menschen. Und äh, die Probleme sind zu groß, dass es eigentlich endlich zu wenig Therapeuten gibt, um in die Sachen einzugreifen. Sure. It would be, except I'll tell you, um, there are lots of people um, who would love to be trained to be orgonomists. And I think that if that whole number was trained, rather than a smaller number of people whose characters were examined carefully, um, I think would do much more harm ultimately than good. Because I think that the most important thing is to preserve like the vital truth. Hi, John. Hi, John. Work out? No, I just want to work. Ah. Uh, um, are we on? Yeah. Okay. Then we have a stop. <laughs> <laughs> then, if you like, you'll be internationally known now. <laughs> You're going to edit that part out, right? <laughs> Most of 
my patients are intelligent, sensitive people who recognize that there are impediments in their life that arise from within themselves that interfere with their functioning and they want better for themselves. Mm -hmm. And the, they are the indications for therapy. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, it's interesting, this question, because at our last seminar, uh, which was just this past Sunday, uh, we discussed we were talking about um, couples therapy and whether one should treat a man and his wife or whether several therapists should treat a man and his wife or whether if you're seeing one member of a, of a family, uh, whether you should be the one who has meetings with both the husband and wife to iron out problems, all those kinds of questions. So somebody presented one of his cases, and he he saw the, um, the the husband for four years in therapy, and in that time, um, his wife left, and he took up with a new girl, married a new girl, and he was afraid that the new relationship wasn't going too well. So he wanted to bring in the new wife to meet with the therapist, or three of them. And in the meeting, the therapist saw that the wife needed therapy as badly as the husband. Uh, but the discussion generally, like everyone agreed, that he shouldn't tell her that. That that was her decision to make, when she felt enough pain or enough discomfort and what he could do is point out all the mechanisms that she was using that were cockeyed mechanisms that were interfering in, in her life or in the relationship mm -hmm. but you never have you never have the right to say to somebody you should be in therapy uh -huh. mm -hmm. if they come and ask you then, yes, but unless they ask you, do you think I need therapy? You have no right to say, you, you should be in therapy, you're sick. Yeah, yeah I tell you, it's, it really is very unfortunate that there are so few therapists in, in Europe. Yeah. It, is, it is a very unfortunate situation. Yeah. I'm sure over time it'll change. Because I'm sure Dr. Tamarella will be training therapists. So maybe in 10, 10 years, yeah. the situation will, will be much improved. Yeah. But at this point, it's the, but not only Europe. Like people in Chicago say, who can I go to? There's nobody around Chicago. Mm -hmm. oh. So even in this country, uh -huh. um, there are just a few centers where there are organ therapists and the whole rest of the country yeah. is empty. Yeah. Uh -huh. And some people travel very long distances yeah. within this country to come here. Yeah. Um. Now I have patients who come from Canada yeah. and um, I had, had a patient from Florida and they come from long distances yeah. to get the therapy. Uh -huh. Uh, well, for example, I, for my case, um, the College of Organomy, the, the Princeton group, is much too rigid. Um, one of the main reasons for the split in this country was that very rigidity. There were people who said this isn't what organomy is about, uh, and we split off and formed another group. Um, now it's very clear that you have to work with the circumstances. 
if there are only a very small handful of, of people doing therapy in Europe, um, you go out of your way to try to train people um, to fill that void. And you don't put up barriers the way the college has been putting up barriers so practically nobody can get in. You know, it's one thing to do what I said, to be very particular about who you permit to practice orgonomy. But on the other hand, um, you don't make it impossible and put up such rigid qualifications that nobody can come in. Yeah. Yeah. I tell you, I have a, a, a feeling that um, like the typical, the most frequent German character is rigid, obsessive compulsive, um, uh, and doesn't deviate very much from what is acceptable and accepted and I think that that probably stands in the, in the way also. Because, you know, I think there is a lot of rigidity in a lot of German characters. And here also, but, you know, not as much as the, uh, as the German character. I know I have a, uh, a, um, patient who's now a student of origami who went to medical school in Germany and <laughs> she flew from Germany. Like she just couldn't stand being there. You have to um, there are lots and lots of applicants to medical school. Um, now there are fewer applicants per uh, people chosen than there, there was, say, five minutes, five years ago. Uh, it used to be something like a ratio of, um, I don't know, some people said 12 to 1, 8 to 1, but it was, most of the people who applied to medical school did not get in. So, um, what it means is that in pre-med, there is tremendous competition. And it's, uh, it's almost like in the business world. Like you never, um, you never give your fellow students the right answer. And um, if you have stolen the question in the examination, you never transmit it to anybody else. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the competition is very keen. And what it means is that uh, predominantly a certain character type gets into medicine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The people who exceed at competition and the people who are good boys. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for example, uh, personality studies that are done of, of medical students show that predominantly they fall into the obsessive compulsive list because of the, the people who could stay up all night and get an A average so that they get into medical school. So getting into medical school has no, no relationship to how well you deal with patients, what your ethics are, um, what your lifestyle is. The only, the only qualification is getting an A in the course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that picks out a very special group of people. Mm -hmm. And that works to the disadvantage of patients. Mm -hmm. Because you have the high achievers who are capable of memorizing whatever you have to memorize in medical school and getting 
good grades and learning the material, but how you deal with, with people is an entirely other matter. I think you have to rely on Gussie to sure get it. Uh, I think you have to rely on um, on physicians because since um, since it is such a powerful medicine, you can do damage, and you have to be aware: is this person nervous because she has an overactive thyroid? And you don't go poking and trying to release emotions if somebody has a hyperactive thyroid, and that's the trouble. And that's why she's shaking all the time. Yeah. So I think you need, in order to do the best work, you need a medical background. Yeah. Now, they're laymen trained, given some medical training, and they take care of the health in villages. And if they run into problems, they contact the doctor, and he either tells them what to do or says, send the patient over to me. But at the lowest level, they do the medical care. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Um, the original group around right um, when I was in Orgonomy. When I started, uh, Dr. Aller was already practicing in Philadelphia. By the way, I'll, I'll ask you later. Um, Dr. Aller was practicing in Philadelphia. Um, and the group of therapists around him were Rachel, Duval, Baker, um, two Trump brothers, yeah. um, Dr. Willie, yeah. Silver, Handelman, Sobe, uh, and I think that's it. Oh, Thorburn. I think that was the group um, around right at that time. Um, there were some um, political machinations. I bet you didn't hear it, did you? time when Dr. Willie apparently was trying to seize too much power and right came down on his head and uh, one thing that that uh, Wright tried to promulgate was um, a kind of work democracy that those people who did the work should have the power, mm -hmm. and that the power derived from the work that one did, and that there were no positions uh, on which you got a crown on your head, and thereafter you ruled everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and at the meetings of what was then called um, Well, the American Association for, I forget the name, okay. but the, the group of doctors had, a, had a, an association and one of the principles was that uh, a new person, a different person conducted each meeting. Uh -huh. There was no president, there was nobody ruling over other people. Um, and that your authority 
as much authority as you had depended on the work that you did. And that's what gave you the authority. And that no authority was handed down forever. If you stopped working, you lost authority. So it was like it was run on principles of work democracy. Later on, um, that principle kind of got lost in the College of Organomy, when there was one head who stayed there for a long time who influenced everyone else, and that's one of the things that led to the separation of the groups also. Actually, I was the last position the right to train. So I was the last in the group. <coughs> but he said, finish with me, which was... Uh, I suppose it was... I'm not good at dates, but I, was, I would say around 1952. Somewhere around then. Um, consequently, since I was the newest and the youngest, I did not have very much influence or authority in, in the group of positions. Um, oh, there was also Dr. Cott. Um, I think the people who were closest to Wright um, and to whom he gave most of the authority at that time were Rayfield, Cox and Baker. Um, Dr. Cott now does um, something called megavitamin therapy, which is uh, the application of huge doses of vitamins for various disorders. They use it, they treat schizophrenics with it. Uh, and Cott is one of the um, original originators of megavitamin therapy. And he's left organomy altogether. I, I was never close to him. Um, and I've had some patients who had been in therapy with him, and they respected him as a therapist. Uh, I have no idea why he why he left around me for mega vitamin therapy. Um, I think he is the only one that I can. Now I don't know what happened to Dr. Willie. Uh, Wright gave Willie a very hard time uh, because Dr. Willie always acted like an aristocrat, and I remember. Once I was in Forest Hills, and this big, long Lincoln drives up in front of Wright's place, and Wright took a look at it through the window like, oh my God, here he comes, and there came Dr. Willie. <laughs> so Wright gave him a hard time. Um, I think all of the others remained in organism. Um, I think that um, at some point there was not too much good feeling from uh, Dr. Rayfield to Dr. Baker, which is what caused that split. Uh, and then there was a much later split from the College of Oregonomy, but there wasn't too much good feeling between some members of the college and other members of the college. Um, it's very interesting. Um, I've been told that Wright um, I think he even mentioned that he had copious notes on all of us, um, which you know, he took during our own therapies. Um, and of course, they can't be this 
they're, they're in the archives, and they can't be disclosed to the public until 50 years after his death. And I don't know if I'm going to live that long, but I'd love to see the kind of liberty they go to me. <laughs> Um, Wright was very Germanic with us physicians. Um, nobody would ever think of calling him uh, Wilhelm or Willie, mm -hmm. that he was Dr. Wright. Uh, and he addressed us the same way. He never addressed us by our first names. It was only Dr. So-and-so, which uh, is you know, a very German way of, of doing things. Um, I was surprised to read that in the old days, in his psychoanalytic days, People did call him Willie. And, you know, they, they addressed one another by their first names. Um, there's only one person that I know of who addressed right familiarly, except for his family, sort of. And that was uh, A.S. Neal. Like, they had a first name relationship. And, uh, that Neil and Wright had a very honest relationship. They criticized one very freely, and they were very, very close friends. But he didn't have that kind of relationship with any of us. Extent, and Wright knew this, there was 
a too muchness about it. And what would say, uh, you wish I had stopped 10 years ago, didn't you? Uh, because we create anxiety in us, or at least in most of us. Because these were you know, wild, new things, totally out of our experience. I'll tell you an interesting thing uh, that occurred in my therapy. Um, once, um, I forget what the exact incident was, but I was talking about something that Wright had written in one of his latest books that came out while I was in therapy. Um, and I was expressing um, some kind of um, disagreement with it. Acknowledging that I hadn't done the experiment and I really didn't know anything about it, but that I was essentially saying, are you sure this is true? And he said, haven't I earned any credit with you? And I said, you know, that's, that's, you, you have. <laughs> Another time, another example of negative transference, um, a different one of his books had come out, and he asked me what I thought of the book. So I told him about some little paragraph in the book which I took issue with. So he said, well, what about the, the whole book? So I said, well, I think the whole book is marvelous. So he said, why did you tell me about that little paragraph? <laughs> so he said, I have built a beautiful new airplane for you, and you tell me you don't like the kinds of nails I put in the floor. So, um, but you know, those kinds of negative things always come out in therapy, or at least in any good therapy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We did have seminars, but we were involved in doing those experiments. He would explain them to us and demonstrate them to us, but there were very few people who participated in the actual experimentation. And maybe except for Silbert and Eva Wright, I don't think any of the physicians. No, they came to us. They just came. Um, there was another. There was a lady, McDonald. I don't know where she is now. If she's still alive. But um, they were people who read right and were in interested in the scientific work that he did, and came up, saw him, and then were interested enough to stay there and work with him. Um, McDonald worked in, in biology, yeah. and McCullough, I think physics probably was his field. Um, yeah. And uh, there were others. There were you know, a couple of other physicists who at least had temporary um, contacts with him. But there were, there were people who were in the sciences who were interested in what they read, so they came up to see him, yeah. and then stayed. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
not in Wright's house, but around the area. And I'm sure they got paid very poorly. So it was really, they were all dedicated workers. And some of them, like uh, McDonald, had been the head of some biology department, some university. So like, it was quite a sacrifice to go up and work with Wright for peanuts when, you know, she had a respectable academic position. So they were all dedicated people. Yeah. You know, they, they were living in Cringely, Maine, which is typical Maine. You know, first of all, to think of right in Maine is kind of strange because the people in Maine are very insular. You know what that means, insular? You know, it's almost as if everybody who comes in is almost like an enemy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the local people are, you know, have to defend themselves against the invaders. So here comes right. There's this German from a, a country they hardly could envision, and then New York, which is also where the devil dwells, and he comes up and establishes a place on one of the hilltops there. So, so that's a really a very strange situation. And then this group of people around him who are coming from all over the country. Not that many, but you know, all of these intruders are coming into the area. So in self-defense, of course, the intruders have to have some kind of feeling of community among themselves because they're living uh, in a society that doesn't particularly welcome them. So sure, they had, you know, that they, they, I'm sure, were all friendly. And I assume that uh, like, I never heard of any hostilities between them or jealousies or things like that. You know, they were all united in working with Wright. And uh, I think they, they each recognized that each of them was uh, dedicated. You mean social uh, contact? Yeah, yeah the, the, um, the, for example, the group that's around Philadelphia. We, we have, I play tennis with one of the other therapists, and we go out evenings together. We're going out to dinner this Saturday night with some of them. So, yeah, we have, like, we generally like one another. There was some guy, I don't know his name. I, I know his name, but I can't remember it. Um, who was a patient. I think he was a psychologist. Yeah, I know he was a psychologist because I know that he has seminars up, up in his place now. And he tried to build a community of people who had been in therapy. Um, you know, to establish a uh, like a little village of the Holy One. And people went up there for vacations. I don't think it lasted too long. And I, I think it's a bad idea. Um, one of the things that every therapist has to deal with is writing cultists. Because there is uh, an enormous tendency among patients, like very often patients, female patients say, do you any, no, have any good uh, male patients that you could introduce me to? And the male patient says the same thing about you know, female patients. And I say, um, that'd be the last thing I would do ordinarily. And one nice anecdote from Dr. Baker, uh, I know someone 
who was going to him as a patient, and she told him, um, I met a guy, and he has lots of the qualities I'm looking for, and we have a wonderful feeling about one another, but he knows nothing about right, and he even knows very little about Freud. And Baker said, grab him. <laughs> so that tendency to, to form communities of, you know, the, the, the ones who are anointed, I think it's terrible. Yeah, well, you know, there are all kinds of cultural arrangements. It's interesting because I, I had a session with a girl this morning who's just gotten out of a relationship, which was a long-term relationship. They weren't married, but they lived together for a long time. It was a very painful separation for both of them. <coughs> and she's recently become reacquainted with someone that she had a mild fling with a long time ago, but they always knew they liked one another. He's now married with a couple of kids, and they become reacquainted. And uh, they're very strongly attracted to one another. So she um, is torn because there is a very strong attraction, and she also has very strong principles about, she says, I don't want to be the one to break up his marriage and harm his kids. Um, and she came in today with two dreams about it. And both dreams said, if you break up this guy's marriage, you're going to pay a very high price. And it said it very clearly. So that's what she's thinking unconsciously. Uh, so she said, uh, now I don't know what I'm going to do about this. She says, I, I know what the dreams are saying. And uh, I know that I feel terrible if I started to have an affair with him. But so like the attraction is there. So she said to me, how do you feel about those things? So I told her that it's, there's a very strong cultural element in these things. I'm not sure that it's, there's some biological, but there's also strong cultural things. And I told her, a, um, you know, I, I said, you know, in France, uh, all of the, uh, whoever can afford it, has a mission. And the wives know it, and it's almost an accepted part of, of the culture. And it's less talked about, but the wives also have affairs. Uh, and then I told her an anecdote. One of our very close friends is a political scientist. And he does a lot of traveling, a lot of lecturing all over the world. And at one point, he was on a trip with another famous uh, political scientist who's a Muslim. So my friend and his wife were traveling with the Muslim and his number one wife. And the, the American wife got very friendly with the Muslim wife. And she said, I'm going to ask you a question. I think we know one another well enough that you won't be offended. But if you are, you don't have to answer the question. So she says, what do you want to know? She said, how do you feel being one of four wives? So she said, I can't imagine how you feel being an only wife. She said, we all um, raise the kids together.
together. We all do the housework together. I can't imagine what it would be like, like if you had to raise the children by yourself and do all the housework and cooking by yourself. So, like to her, it was absolutely no problem sharing that man with three other women. That never entered her head. So there's a large cultural factor. Well, sometimes it's reserved. You know, there are areas where one woman has several husbands. In those areas where it's, uh, for example, where the, uh, the land isn't very productive, so that one man can't produce enough food, one woman marries three men because three men can bring in enough food to raise a family. So, you know, nature makes its own circumstances. Your partner must be dying out there. They have a, there, there's a uh, girl with them. She's sitting in, the, in their van because when their van was parked here yesterday, they broke the window, they broke into it and stole something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sitting out in the van. What they do is, uh, Dr. Du has a seminar for students in the last year of med school who discuss an ergonomic view of the physical disorders, the somatic disorders that they have studied, how an ergonomist would look at those disorders. And then, um, then they have a hiatus because we don't start the regular seminars until they're in their second year of a psychiatric residency because uh, it's assumed that in the first year they won't have a psychiatric vocabulary yet. But by the second year, they have a psychiatric vocabulary, they've learned to think psychiatrically, and they've seen a fair number of patients. So then you can start discussing psychiatric patients. So that seminar goes on for a couple of years. And then they have, when, they, when they're finished their residency, sometimes in their last year of residency, they take on a patient or two, and they have a supervisor assigned to them. And the supervisor switch, like a patient has a supervisor for a certain length of time, and somebody else supervises them. And they discuss the patients who they have under treatment. And then, after they are out of their residency and have had a fair number of patients, then they come to the grown-up seminar. Mm -hmm.